many PhDs does it take to bring up a... <laughs> Obviously, at least one more than we have. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, my name is Tushar Saxena. I'm, uh, I'm new to Radius. I just joined about three months ago. Uh, one of the reasons I joined this company is because its mission is really to make um, carriers move, uh, the service providers move towards cloud as seamless and as effective as possible. And how are we doing that? Today's talk is going to talk about one of the ways we are accomplishing that. You know, obviously OCP um, itself brings very effective, you know, from a thermal, from a, from a cost perspective, very effective architectures for, you know, large hyperscale data center, uh, you know, users such as Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. But if you look at telcos in general, they have some extra requirements beyond just building a data center. You know, they're used to um, availability, they're used to certain characteristics that could be classified as carrier grade. So one of the missions that our company has is to make sure that the carriers can adopt these OCP architectures um, into their environment as seamlessly as possible. Uh, so one of the ways we did that is by contributing a spec to OCP called CG Open Rack 19. So in today's talk, we're going to talk about two things. One is what is CG Open Rack 19, and the other is how is the ecosystem evolving. Jeff already gave his talk earlier today and mentioned it a little bit. We're going to get more into more details about it. Um, so we have a whole bunch of folks. Uh, since this is about ecosystem, we uh, brought at least four, and Jeff's already spoken, so that makes us five. We've got Verizon here, who's going to talk to you guys about, from a service provider perspective, what they see uh, as beneficial about this spec and what, what, you know, how they want to see it evolve over the next few years. Uh, and then we have uh, the vendors, uh, two of us, Radisys and uh, uh, AD Link, uh, I'm sorry, and, and Artisan that's going to talk about it. So with that, um, helping me out here is Andrew, who's the CTO of Radisys. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Tim, uh, who is from Artisan. We've got DJ, uh, as we lovingly call him, from uh, Verizon. He's our customer. Um, and as I said, again, Jeff's already talked, and we've got um, the architects who kind of wrote the CG Open Rack 19 spec, Matt and Paul here as well in the crowd if you have more technical questions. With that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Andrew to talk a little bit about the history of the spec. <clears throat> All right, well, um, try to keep this moving since we started a little bit late. Um, we've had a few talks over time, so we're not going to get into much uh, technical depth here. We wanted to get a little bit more into the, the products and uh, <clears throat> how this thing is launching. But um, we did want to talk a little bit of philosophy as to you know why this is here and kind of what it's uh, uh, trying to do. Um, and uh, for those of you who are new, I do apologize. We, we could take a little bit of time, you know, kind of on a tutorial, but that's uh, that won't be the whole time for this session. Um, but there are, there are, there is material um, from previous sessions that go a little bit more into that. Um, but I actually just realized we should probably just get a quick picture here before we. Um, okay, we can't. Okay, <laughs> so. We're going to start with a bunch of words, I just realized. But let me just uh, uh, verbally describe um, kind of what this is. The, um, this is a, a contribution. Uh, it's been approved, um, and it's called Carry Grade Open Rack 19. So it's a derivative of Open Rack. Um, and the idea is that it's drafting off of Open Rack, and it's going to stay aligned with Open Rack, but it isn't exactly the same thing. Um, it borrows a lot of the same concepts, you know, but it's not uh, mandatory or intended that it be you know completely compatible, okay? Uh, and one of the reasons was that uh, for that was to you know create a space where you could actually make some changes to be a little bit tuned for this telco data center um, uh, environment. Um, so on the uh, exhibit uh, floor, you know you can see a couple examples. I think we have a slide here that uh, Tim will will show and, and, and talk about. Um, the physical difference, uh, the biggest differences are that it is, it is 19 inches, it is two sleds across, um, and that's, in a nutshell, that's the biggest difference. And then there's a, a number of subtle differences. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about kind of why, you know, why that was done. Um, if you've been, you know, involved in, in OCP, the, the tenants that drive OCP, and if you do a submission, you have to think about this on every single thing that goes in, you know, how does this apply? It's openness efficiency, scale, and actually we left this one off, but it's impact. Why, why are you doing that? Uh, and that's kind of what this whole talk is about. What's the impact? It's really the, I'll start with that one. This is bringing OCP 
collaboration and specifically open rack uh, technology into you know a carrier environment and really making it more palatable uh, and easier to deploy like uh, Tushar said um, so just focusing on those you know what what are those attributes that are coming out in this uh, you know what's different again you'll see some you know more with the examples um, so you start with openness. That's kind of what this is about. It's just been sort of open from day one. Um, we got involved in collaboration actually with Verizon at the very beginning. So it didn't start as a product concept from, from us. It started as a, hey, how do we bring open rack into a carrier environment specifically uh, working with Verizon, you know, uh, and it could, could have started with, you know, let's, let's simply, you know, bring a product that already exists. But we looked at, um, you know, some of the things that, that maybe can make it a little bit uh, uh, more tuned uh, to the environment. But, so it's been open, it's been collaborative from day one. And for the last year, we've been collaborating in this ecosystem. We've been, you know, talking about what we're doing, um, inviting more to join, and we continue to do that. So we want to see this ecosystem uh, grow. This is not a Radisys thing, uh, ideally, although we're certainly involved. Um, the, the other thing was to kind of get some alignment with some standards. Uh, standards have become almost kind of a dirty word, so I'm careful with that, but you know, they do exist. And for example, 19 inch is a standard. Um, uh, there are other um, you know, standards in terms of environmental uh, uh, requirements, and some of them are relaxing, um, but there are, there are constraints. So you know, we wanted to say, you know, if you're in a completely green field, right, which was the beginning of OpenRack, you have a lot of things you can do, and, 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 and that's great, right? You don't have to conform to certain things. But if you have those things, you have these standard geometries, you have 19-inch racks, you have certain types of power distribution, um, you know, why not leverage them? So we're trying to bring these things together. Um, one of the, with the geometry, the 19-inch is part of it. The other part is, is just going to a half-width uh, uh, dimension on the sleds. Um, a half width and normal, kind of normal heights, 1U, 2U, and so forth. So you end up with uh, your basic building block that is a, a, a 2U half width or full width sled. I think uh, Jeff showed a couple examples of that. This is a uh, 2U half width sled you can see here, and I think Tim will hold it up and maybe show it. Um, that geometry actually allows consumption of a number of off-the-shelf products. So it allowed this thing to go very, very quickly. Um, you can put a uh, open rack uh, sled that is one third of a 22 inch width into there with some adaptation. You can also put a half SSI form factor sled, and there's a lot of those in the market. So, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of leverage. Um, the other thing, and Jeff uh, spoke nicely to this. This geometry gives you a little bit of space to work with some heterogeneous solutions. So obviously data centers are fairly homogeneous and they're becoming more so, and that's a good thing because you want really you know, to differentiate in your software. But you get different kinds of workloads and there are some needs for certain kinds of acceleration. Um, and again, especially for some of the specialty processing you know, that um, is still needed and, and maybe even accelerate with 5G. So, you know, with this kind of a geometry, you can actually put accelerated cards. You can put PCI Express cards in there. You can put mezzanines. There's, there's a little bit more room to do that. And again, that gives you a little bit of a, a kind of a, a future proofing. Um, maybe I would come to this, um, and I don't know which one it falls under, but <clears throat> the speed at which this spec can change and evolve is up to the community. However, in the telco environment, in carrier environment, maybe you don't want to change quite as quickly as things have changed in a more of a captive web scale environment. So if Facebook you know, is deploying something and they make a change and there's another 8,000, know, they can make those changes and deploy them. But the, the scale uh, on the telco side is a little bit different. So you're kind of aggregating the scale you know, of multiple uh, providers to get to that same kind of web scale. So one of the things you want to do is, 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 is have a little bit of control over the pace of change. Uh, and having a geometry and, and some standards that you kind of align to that allow that to kind of hold in place for longer is a good thing. Um, again, we keep saying, you know, it's, we're, the starting point is, is open rack. Um, and, um, and then we've tried to change as little as possible. Um, I'm sorry, what else? The, um, the other area in terms of um, uh, some of the changes, um, we're uh, bringing in some ability to uh, shield and isolate. Um, again, those are, those are requirements that you, um, you might see. They may not matter in every environment, but they may. Um, 
Let's see, what else do I want to get here? Okay, then the, the, the last thing I want to talk about on the, uh, on, the, again, on the architecture, and this is not specific to a telco, but we did make this change in the architecture. And I think, again, Jeff's example kind of shows both parts of it. We took, example, uh, took a, advantage of um, uh, sort of a, a blind mate interconnect topology in, in the back, okay? So what that does is it, it really gives you um, the ability to configure a rack uh, for a, uh, a particular instance, a particular skew of a rack with a particular uh, 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 topology and not change it. So your cabling between sleds is all in the back. It doesn't have to be that way. The spec defines that interconnect, um, but you can also cable in the front. So you have some choices there, and that's what Jeff showed, you know, front access and things you can do there. But what you get with the rear cabling is the ability to put things in and then just repeat them, you know, without touching those cables. You can also swap a sled. I think the example yesterday of, you know, um, in the video of, uh, of, of replacing a sled and actually replacing a memory component. Well, if you're just swapping a sled, you can do it here in, you know, five seconds, right? Because you don't actually have to unplug any cables. You take the sled out, you put the next one in. Um, so that's driving some efficiency um, and actually helping with the scale because it's a lot easier to service. Um, and so, that is not a particular, you know, that is not unique to telco. That could be a, an innovation that could be used in any data center anywhere, but it is part of this architecture. Um, I think I'll stop there because we want to get into the examples. Yeah, so that's just what this is, kind of how we got into it, and I think better to hear directly from, uh, uh, you know, some people that are actually using it. So I think we're going to, yeah, I'm going to skip right over that. Um, quick snapshot of where we are, and then my hand to DJ here. Um, the, uh, we call it the framework or the interoperability spec that is uh, approved. That's called CG Open Rack 19. There will be more contributions that, let's say, are not company specific, not product specific, but more about you know the architecture. Um, I think there's some need on the management side. We actually have a, a talk coming in about half an hour um, on the management track that uh, one of our colleagues are doing. Um, uh, and that could lead to some contributions. Um, and also at the, uh, the spec currently defines the interop at the sled level, uh, t touching on the rack, but it doesn't define that much about the rack. I think there's room for some more uh, uh, definition there, again, on the framework side. Um, and then there's product contributions. Uh, you'll see the product contributions. Uh, you saw that AD Link is doing one, um, Artisan uh, talking about their product. Um, Radisys also has a product, which we'll talk about. You know, so not only are we endorsing and uh, driving the spec, but we're also delivering products, uh, and those are being contributed as well. Um, there are other standards alignment. Um, that was something that popped up in the work group call. Some of you may have participated in, you know, how does this fit into, you know, sort of NFVI definition? And it's a very good fit, um, but we're just making sure that things do align. So I think there's some work that can be done there. And then really the biggest thing here is just expanding the ecosystem. This is new. Uh, and so by definition with something new, you, you know, you're not going to have, you know, a ton of participants on day one, but um, it, it's growing and it's getting deployed. Um, so um, it's real, it works, um, and it's unfolding. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, so as you heard from Andrew, you know, uh, three main reasons there is a need for CG Open Rack 19. You know, one is uh, the geometry uh, for carriers. You know, 19-inch rack is an appropriate one, especially as they move their central offices to a data center type environment, uh, you know, deploying things like code, for example. Uh, the second is operation, oper uh, operating costs, right? I mean, carriers are very, very sensitive to keeping the operating costs low. So as, as, as you'll see in the geometry, you know, there's blind mate connections in the back, there's bus bars. It's just extremely easy to pull a sled out, push a new one in. Um, you know, the serviceability is extremely uh, efficient, and that's very helpful to the operators because operating cost is everything to these guys. Uh, you know, keeping the truck rolls to the minimum, et cetera. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, you know, having a growing ecosystem. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, each of Facebook, Google, Microsoft, they have huge scales. But if you think about the operators, even a large operator with 3,000 central offices, let's say they wanted to convert all 3,000 to data centers. You know, you put what, two racks in each? That's about, you know, 6,000 racks. That's still minuscule scale compared to a Facebook or, an, or, a, or a Microsoft or a Google. So what CG Open Rack 19 also does, you know, sort of as a corollary is that it gives you a spec by which all the carriers combined can live by creates larger volumes for the vendor community
to produce to, right? So you can serve multiple operators with the same spec. Uh, ecosystem is extremely important. Spec is only as good as the number of people participating in it. Right now it's small. Uh, we've got, you know, Radices, as I mentioned, is an overall integrator. We would help the carrier migrate to an OCP type data center environment from soup to nuts, um, including integrating software and services. Um, the racks are being produced by Pentair uh, to the CG Open 19 spec. We've been collaborating with them. As far as the sleds, there already are three, uh, three vendors producing the sleds. We have our own, uh, AD Link and Artisan, of course. Um, and in today's, uh, um, uh, you know, today's sessions as well, there are at least three different talks um, related to CG Open Rack 19 uh, that you can go to. With that, I will hand it over to DJ. He's going to speak about what the carrier see in it. Okay. So my name is Damasin Joaquim Palai for all of those people that want to know my name, but they call me DJ for short. And if you want to reach me, it's uh, DJ at Verizon.com, which is the shortest email that you can ever find in Verizon. Uh, having said that, uh, put that aside, um, what led us to uh, the carrier grade Open 19 uh, was uh, a little conversation I was having with one, with one of our management team people, and we were sitting and wondering, how do we take advantage of this concept called open compute? And uh, uh, so my uh, manager was, at the time, he was saying, unless we move to open compute, this is not going to work. We have to go into an open spec. This is not happening in the carriers fast enough. So here you go, go figure out what this open compute is all about. This was back in 2015. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of history. So I just hopped into a plane, went to Oregon, went to Facebook, uh, went and met a few people like Omar, and tried to figure out what exactly is open compute. Is it a specification? Is it, what is it? So then I, I come to realize that it's a way of uh, sourcing hardware to make sure that you can fit into your particular way of operating your environment. And so when we went and looked around, what is it that is being built? There were super large uh, infrastructure plays that you cannot, uh, one and a half frames will be enough to actually run some of the workloads that we were having at the time. So we looked at it and said, what is it that, that would work for us in our environment, and what is it that is not going to work for us in our environment? And we said, all these cabling coming in the front and having no um, enclosure, so the EMI was not protected in a lot of ways. And then they also had this component level replacement model which may or may not work for all of us, because some of us are not as uh, uh, nimble with our hands and feet like the, uh, the Facebook operating guys where they can actually pop a CPO in three seconds and put a new one in and push it in. If we try to do the same thing, we'll probably have a 50% failure rate and we'll probably have to ship back half the sleds back to the manufacturer. So looking at all of those variations, we decided that the best thing to do is to make sure create a minimal touch environment wherein the people that are maintaining are going to just pull a sled and push a sled, and that's about all they're going to do. If there's a failure, they're going to pull one out and push a new one in and send it back to a depot to get it <coughs> fixed, whatever way that shape or form it takes. So having decided on that and having decided, so the other big part of running any of these data centers is actually the way you build and orchestrate your software. If your software will not behave the way Facebook software works or Google software works, all of this high scale is not, is not going to be working very easy. It's going to be extremely difficult to manage an environment if you don't have proper monitoring, proper orchestration system. So we put a lot of emphasis on what is going to be our workload orchestration environment going to look like. And at that time, we decided not to spend too much time on virtualization, but go directly to a containerization model. And so we presently have a, a fairly decent size uh, four data center operation, uh, which uh, has carrier open 19 uh, frames that has installed. And we probably have one of the largest uh, containerized workload running in that environment. And um, 
and we have uh, had some hiccups because you know we are learning and some of these technologies are fairly new uh, and some of them uh, we have been very surprised to find that they are very stable uh, so to to give an example our networking layer that we decided to actually just stay with standard Linux kind of networking environment. And we went looking for who has the most standard Linux environment that is available. And we came across Cumulus at the time was the one that actually had the most Linux native uh, networking stack. So we actually took them and started running with them. And uh, to our surprise, so far, we haven't had too many issues at all at the networking layer. And also, we simplified the network design to make sure that everything works fine. So, so that is on the, on the software side. Then we went back to the hardware side. And then we started working with the Redis. And Matt here knows uh, the complete history of um, all the conversations we had. And so does Tim here. Uh, we actually had repeated conversation as to how best to create this uh, form factor, so to speak. What works, what doesn't work. How should we do it? Should it be OU, RU? What is the best way to make sure that it actually is going to fit and run and replaceable and uh, figure out how best to support it? Do I have to have a 24-hour replacement or do I have to have a next business day replacement? What is the operating cost going to be? What is the installation time going to be? We looked at all of those variables and we decided that this probably fits best uh, to what we want to do. So after uh, doing, going through some wrangling uh, back in um, October 2015, uh, we decided to pull the trigger on, create this frame for us. Let's go and figure out what it's going to take. Worst case, we'll shut off and we'll move on back to whatever we knew before. The best case, we'll move forward with it. I am so glad that after two years, I can stand here and say that we went forward with it, and we never looked back. And I don't think we are going to look back for the foreseeable future, because it works. Uh, why the, the few touch points that I can tell you why I believe that it works is we had very little failure rates during installation or post-installation. So I think today, from the time it comes onto our docks to the time it gets installed, and almost ready to run is about two days or two and a half days. Uh, and that's for uh, uh, about 30 frames. It takes about two and a half days for 30 frames to be brought up, which is unheard of before. Because the, in the previous generation, when we had to do this uh, by hand, it took us two months for doing the same size. So from two months to two days is a significant improvement. And that actually gives us a way to not build too much up ahead. And so you can actually build as you go. So it, it gave us a lot of advantages to actually having this flexibility to allow us to build as you go, to be able to instantiate, run, and uh, make it happen within two and a half days. All of that actually worked in our favor. And so we decided to pull the trigger on it. And we are going to keep on maintaining that. The second thing that we wanted to do was, whenever we go looking around, when we want to have variations on a theme, it's almost very difficult to find an alternate uh, CPU on a motherboard. It's, it's going to take a lot longer for somebody to create. Again, we went and, we, we went and said, oh, we want to create um, an Octeon base, a, a, a Cavium Thunder X base blade. It was done probably in about a couple of months, uh, and we had samples, and we actually have uh, provided the uprev kernel versions for that ARM chip that came from Verizon Labs about uh, three, four months ago. So now we actually have it running for the last about six months, a whole series of uh, Thunder X blades in our environment. Similarly, we went to um, uh, Artisan, and we asked them, we need um, uh, a high density uh, uh, blade with uh, NVIDIA because everybody is hot and heavy on NVIDIA for video transcoding. And so we went and asked them and they actually were able to create one and uh, they were waiting on the part to come in. And once the part came in, they were able to ship a few of them to us in a very short order of time. 
So the, the speed with which we can innovate on this is fairly quick because most of the components are coming from the hardware when manufacturers themselves, the chip manufacturer actually produces most of the layout and et cetera. So they basically can quickly assemble it, put it together. The form factor is predefined and it's so easy for us to just push it in. The, the biggest component is actually now on the software side. How do I get all my workloads running in? How do I test it? How do I verify it? And so we are actually going to go down that path of verification of certain targeted um, workloads for certain targeted uh, hardware platforms and we'll just keep on rolling it out. So that's how we are and that's where we are today and I think uh, we will continue this process as we go along. Thanks, DJ. Um, two things in my hands. All right, welcome. My name is Tim Casto. I'm the rep Tim Casto, the representative from Artisan here this morning. Glad to be with you talking about CG Open Rack 19. So who, who is Artisan Embedded Technologies? We're two divisions, uh, the power side and the compute side. You can see some of the logos here, Force Computers, Emerson, Aztec, Artisan, Motorola Computer Group, et cetera, et cetera. Technology and business, business leaders um, in the embedded and computing space located here in Silicon Valley, in the Silicon Desert, Europe, and um, Asia coming together to supply solutions for the telecom networking and embedded markets. So why CG Open Rack 19? Why did Artisan get into this space? Primarily, it's a rapid growth market for us. We see a lot of opportunity here, not just the data centers growing at an unprecedented rate, as you'll see through the rest of the um, presentations at this seminar, but actually inside the telco space as well. What we're seeing is in the past, fixed functions, whether it was networking or voice transcoding, are migrating over to software-defined solutions on general purpose computers. And so what that means is the growth of general purpose computing architectures are expanding rapidly. Also our customers, we've been servicing the telecom market for, for decades, and they're asking for, like DJ said, more generic hardware architectures that they can deploy their software on. They don't want those specific fixed function boxes anymore in their networks. Also. CG Open Rack 19 lowers OPEX dramatically. We've already seen examples of how Open Compute lowers OPEX, but this sled here, unfortunately I have a mic. This doesn't get replaced in three minutes, it gets replaced in five seconds because it's a simple power split and a simple blind make optical connector on the back. Very easy, very trivial. That will lower your OPEX as a, this will lower your OPEX operating expenses, installation time, bring up time dramatically. And the CG Open Rack 19, it leverages the open compute and hyperscale volumes. One way to assure that a computer architecture or any architecture drops in price is to join together with other vendors, bring in other customers, leverage what already is generic commodity hardware and encapsulate it in a simple metal box and proliferate that in the industry. That will drive the prices, that will bring the prices down as more people jump on board. The value of the cloud. Open compute allows you to create, deploy, and modify services in a small fraction of the time it took in a traditional network because there's no specialized hardware. It can scale infinitely. Since all the modules are identical, you can just add new ones quickly, roll out your software across them, and very easy maintenance. The value of carrier grade Open Rack 19 brings a whole bunch more specifically to the telco and carrier specific space. 19 inch rack mounting, we've seen that being very important. The 23 inch, 21 inch held a lot of people back, no more. Cable free design, I saw that guy yesterday in the, um, in the, in the video unplug the cables and I immediately thought he could plug them back in the wrong place or he could break them. When you've got fiber optics, you really don't want 
people unplugging them and plugging them back in. That is a recipe for disaster. So a cable-free design is definitely an improvement here. Also, just airflow. If you have too many cables, you're going to block airflow, heat's going to go up, and, and the CPU is not going to work correctly. Improved system management. OCP is fairly loosey-goosey around system management. Carrier grade brings in at least 10 new requirements levied on the sled for system management. That'll make the software job a lot easier to manage the hardware resources down in there, whether it's the temperature, the volts, the fans, the state, the CPU, whatever. All of that BMC traffic that's down there kind of captured and not being used, it comes out through the sled through a specialized management port. And ultimately, multi-vendor interop. Open Compute Project is a wonderful open specification, but it's so open that different boards and sleds and racks can't always fit together very easily. So a multi-vendor interop is important so that you can control your supply chain, create um, competition in your vendors. So it's addressing the telco carrier specific requirements are addressed in order to reduce the OPEX even further, scale the bandwidth from 10 up to 100 and beyond. The optical connector in the back has 96 possible f ferrules, okay? You can imagine how much bandwidth you can get out of that. The in in instantiation that Verizon's using is really only using four of them, so there's plenty of room to grow there. You can put the rack in, wire up the network, and then you can grow your bandwidth as you need it. And also, it allows for country-specific environmental specs. We want this spec to proliferate around the world, and having it enclosed in a metal box, you can shield it for EMI, and uh, you can control the volts and so forth. Okay, I'm not going to go through this giant eye chart, and the colors aren't always shown, but what you want to look at is the different options that a carrier would have if he wishes to deploy um, compute architectures out into his network. If he wants to take advantage of rack mount servers, bladed servers, open compute, ra open compute gear that's out there, or CG Open Rack 19. Are any of these on the left features that you want as a telco or as a service provider? I would say probably yes. Only CG Open Rack 19 addresses all of these correctly. Blind mate, optical, scalable interconnect, rapid replacement, an open specification, cross-vendor consistency, power footprint. I mean, some of these open compute frames are 25, 30 kilowatts, but there's a lot of data centers, telco data centers, that can really only handle 4 kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, 12 kilowatts. So you need an architecture that can scale up, but it can also scale down cost-effectively, and this can do that. NEB's capable. Clearly, this is not NEB certified at this point, but it has the mechanical structure and the electrical interface to allow that to happen if you do need a NEB's um, product. Interop. This is a victory. So, Radius has had a solution running in the Verizon um, data center and in the labs when they came to us, and we built a GPU based sled. We plugged it in for the first time on site in the customer lab, and I can assure you it came up and it worked. It was not a lot of debugging. There was not a lot of mechanical fitting. There was not electrical issues at all. It just basically came up and functioned the first time. So what this allows is you to see that unlike the data center where the FRU, the entire frame that gets rolled in, is the, is the replaceable um, unit or the, the new unit, it's the sled. You can, have a f you can have a frame fully stocked out with compute or storage, and then you can add to it or change to it very easily with a, uh, another vendor sled that comes out, whether it's you know, an ARM-based sled or whether it's a GPU-based sled or whatever comes down the pike tomorrow. Today, Artisan is announcing, uh, some of you may have received it in your email bin, a NVIDIA-based GPU sled that conforms to the CG OpenRack 19 specification. I have an example of one up front we can look at. It'll be in the Radisys booth over in the, uh, the demo hall later this afternoon, and we can open it up, look inside. It's wide open. We also have compute sleds available, storage sleds available, other sleds available as needed. So you could just rename a sleds are us if you want to. 
I just want to be clear on how simple the interface is. The blind mate optical connector, it's a Molex with 96, uh, up to 96 connect connections right here, six ganged uh, ferrule sets. The OCP, 12 volt integrated bus bar connection. On the front, a simple handle and a simple uh, clip latch to get it in and out. Also assures um, mechanical rigidity for vibration testing. And the optional user interface, just some LEDs on the right hand side. Simple, safe, repeatable. Let's take a minute to look inside the GPU sled design itself. It has a standard SSI server motherboard with two E5 Xeon class pro processors, plenty of DIMM sockets to support that. On the, we have four PCIe slots on custom risers that we produce that can hold either two full length, full height PCIe cards, two full height, three quarter length. And what we populated with for this instantiation was four NVIDIA M4 GPU cards to allow um, a variety of workloads that NVIDIA GPUs excel at, uh, deep learning, transcode, um, video imaging, et cetera, et cetera. For boot, there's room for two, two and a half inch drives, an M.2 boot storage, and plenty of cooling here with the quieter 80 millimeter fans in the front, push air completely across the assembly and out the back. The back is where the dual 10 gig or optionally 25 gig NICs are. That is a module that Artisan developed that is very easy to um, design a new one if 40 gig or 100 gig comes down the pipe. So integrating all of the pieces, um, Artisan as one of the premier vendors in compute and power, we have power um, division supplying power racks to most of the hyperscale guys right now, and Artisan is the computer side. We have a long history of providing integrated solutions for telecoms and OEMs. We've got a rich experience doing this, a deep knowledge of how to apply off-the-shelf technology. This is basically an assembly of easily procured components and a mix of some custom-built daughter cards to come together to create a solution. Um, a, a good breadth of product, um, so you don't have vendor lock, you don't have to just stick with one vendor, you can go to any of us to get solutions. Adherence to the CG OpenRack 19 spec, our, our history is defining, creating, and building products to meet specifications, whether it's IEEE, PICMIG, or OCP, and now CG OpenRAC 19. We know how to do that. We know how to work with other vendors to create products. We have worldwide presence to ensure support and service as needed, and an infrastructure to support 24-hour uh, or shorter sparing as needed. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'll quickly run through some of the products that um, Radisys has in this um, area as well. Of course, um, you know we pioneered the CG Open Rack 19. As I mentioned, you know the the you know our main mission in life, Radisys' main mission is to make sure that we provide all the support necessary to an operator to migrate to OCP architectures for their data centers, be it in the central office or be it in a, a centralized data center. Uh, so we offer everything from producing the hardware, the racks, the sleds, etc., as well as pre-integrating the software and qualifying all kinds of software, uh, management plane, uh, and then services, on-site services and support services to pull the whole solution together uh, for an operator. So we're sort of one-stop shop working with our partners like Artisan and, and, and ADLink and others uh, to pull a solution together for operators. Uh, we do have hardware products of our own. Uh, this is uh, the product line that I manage, which, is, uh, which includes a CG Open Rack 19. Um, it's not certified yet, but we are about to submit it, but it's based on that spec. Uh, we have a 600 millimeter and an 800 millimeter version. Uh, we also um, have, uh, right now, multiple sleds. We have at least one half width compute sled uh, with a variety of processors and memory configurations qualified for it, and a full width to you uh, storage sled as well with a lot of um, 
a lot of storage in it, disks in it, uh, as well as an SSD version coming out. Uh, we also have some specialty sleds. Um, we have a media sled, for example, that will allow you to do transcoding, uh, et cetera. They're all, I think the one thing, one takeaway you should have here is in this product line that Radisys has called DC Engine, every product, whether it's a rack or a sled or a specialty sled, a compute sled, a storage sled, every product is going to be CG Open Rack 19 certified. Okay, they are not right now. They are built to the spec, but we plan to. Uh, our plan is to uh, submit all of these products for CG Open Rack 19. And with that, um, I will um, hand over to Andrew again. Uh, you want to talk about the website? Sure. Okay. Um, you know, in order to kind of um, expand the ecosystem and and sort of create. Um, um, uh, a one-stop place where you know operator customers can come in and take a look at the ecosystem and all the products that are available per the spec. We are proposing. There is discussion going on the, on the mailing list right now. Uh, a, a CG Open Rack 19.org website. It will be cross-linked back to OCP, of course. Um, it would be. Uh, it would essentially you should view this as a sub-website within OCP, uh, but it's, it's focused more on end-to-end -end solutions for operators that leverage the CG Open Rack 19 spec to create, for example, an r chord solution perhaps, or an m chord solution, or other solutions that they might need. So the objective here is to identify all the products and the ecosystem of uh, vendors that support this spec and can work with operators to create solutions for them. Perfect. Andrew, you want to add anything? No. Okay. With that, I'll leave some, leave some time for Q&A. Understanding is that most OCP uh, hardware requires lead-free. Is that a conflict? Uh, how do you reconcile that? Is that question for Verizon? About yes. What, what, what's lead, the question? Lead-free lead requirements. Lead-free or private software right now? Do you have a requirement for lead-free? Well, whatever the prevailing requirement is, what we would like to have, but uh, we are not particularly looking at that, but. Uh, if you have to have ROHS compliance in, in Europe and other places, you may have to be lead free, I'm pretty sure. So if you have leaded components, you, you have to, it will be in your best interest not to have them. Uh, it, I, I don't have to mandate it, it's actually better for you not to have it. Oh, for telco equipment, so presently we are not deploying this in the telco space. We are deploying this primarily in the data center space that we have. But when we go into uh, telco space, we will look at that as uh, whether that requirement is absolutely required or not. If we haven't challenged that requirement yet internally. And just to, so while that's a viable discussion, the spec itself pretty much has no position on it. I mean. This is the components inside, so of course we can be as lead-free <laughs> as you want to be, um, and as G DJ said, or yeah, or exactly. lettered as lettered as you <laughs> want it to be. <laughs> That's right. There, there is nothing uh, uh, expressly telling in this spec that you should not have lead. That's right. It's it's whatever you want to have, and it is is fine. Yeah. But we haven't internally challenged ourselves to see whether that lead requirement is still a big requirement or not. Others. Yeah, I think given the in the time, just briefly, but um, um, Suzanne, when's your session? 11 o'clock? <laughs> 11.30 in the management track. If you're able to attend, that would be interesting. But um, we, you know, and DJ can speak to it a bit. Um, it's fairly loose right now from kind of the bottom up. You know, there are things at the rack level. And I said, I think there's room for more contributions to say what would we want to standardize or uh, across the ecosystem. From a RADIS's point of view, you know, we focused on inventory management, um, you know, basic power management, connectivity to the sleds, and actually, um, we've actually taken and, and, and integrated the R, uh, Intel RSD uh, uh, management framework as a proxy. So we actually don't run it on every sled, it's as, it's as a pro proxy at the rack level. So that's something we're doing, and I believe that'll, we'll be talking about that at 11 o'clock in the, in the other uh, uh, session. And for those of you who can't attend it, just find that one, and, and you can, the slides are all uh, online. 
Yeah, maybe uh, DJ, you can speak yeah, to that. I, I mean, the, the spec itself doesn't doesn't drive anything. Obviously, there's going to be many, uh, and we're involved in many opportunities. DJ, you can talk about what what Verizon's doing. Yeah. So in our particular case, because we are primarily focused on uh, doing containerized workload, and when we went live in uh, 2016 January, there was the OpenStack was not supporting containerized workloads at all at the time. The only available options that we had that was fully functional and that was already proven in some other environment was uh, Mesos. So we actually standardized on Mesos, uh, Apache Mesos is what we run as orchestrator. Maybe just one other quick comment because it won't come in the other session. We a different project that we've been very involved in, so we associate these two. But to be clear, it's, we're not binding them. This is this is this is a hardware specification, you know, with management appropriate for it. We've done a lot of work with the Cord project, and as a result of that, we've done integration, you know, with this specification, um, and then it brings in sort of a, a layer of orchestration for some of those specific projects um, that that we've also, you know, um, integrated. You know, with uh, with this architecture. So, so we presently have about uh, seven applications targeted at at the infrastructure that we have. Uh, one is um, a very large scale uh, cloud storage environment that we run, uh, and then we also have IoT. Our IoT platform is based on. Uh, running in, in, in an environment like this. And uh, almost all our applications are now containerized and ready to deploy it. Any others? Sure, last one. He's asking that what, what is the difference comparison between live home server and system versus this? Oh, so if, when, when we look at the uh, capital uh, outlay that we have, uh, no matter who you go to, about 70% will go to the CPU and memory vendor. Uh, the manufacturer of the CPU and memory is going to take about 60 to 65% of all the money you spend. And then whatever that's remained uh, will go to the hard drive manufacturer. And so the margins on these things are probably way for thin. So, so, <laughs> so there is not much uh, that you can do. So essentially, it is in the CPU vendor's best interest to make the environment as cost effective as possible. Otherwise, they are going to be uh, booted out of business, so to speak. So it, it really is whether I buy it from A, B, or C because the money is just flowing through somebody to somebody else, it makes no difference who I buy it from, to be honest with you. That's, that's the realization we came to, finally. Yeah, one thing just to add to what DJ said is that the, the spec and OCP in general uh, allows you to make uh, uh, you know, racks that can be, carry a lot of density, a lot of CPUs, right? So even though, like he's saying, 70% does, you know, 60%, 70% flows through to the CPU vendor, the number of CPUs is the number of CPUs, whether you go with the rack mount or this kind of system, but the footprint can be small here. And so there are some savings in terms of real estate, there's some savings in terms of you know, how much switching gear you need and all that stuff. So overall total cost of ownership. But I think uh, also one thing to mention is for a carrier, operating cost is everything, right? Only 50% of your data center cost is CapEx, the rest of it is all OpEx. And the fact that this is so easily serviceable helps a lot on the OpEx side.